you. I'm publicly turning over the sand thing so you can heckle me when it hits the bottom. Um, genuine newness is quite rare. The Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius once said that an intelligent, reflective person of 40 had seen everything that could possibly happen in the world. Um, and that's either a, a comforting idea or a slightly depressing one, depending on your temperament. Um, but it's also not quite true, because genuinely new things do come along. And it's important to recognise that when they do, they always, newness always appears as contestation. It contests things that already ex exist. It's different from them. And it's often quite hard to recognise newness for what it is. And it makes newness difficult to process. So <coughs> I'm going to talk today about Bitcoin, which is a genuinely new thing. And as part of the consequence of that, that you go on this odd trajectory when you find out about Bitcoin. Everyone I, I know who's taken an interest in it goes, has, goes through the same thing, which is that you start by being baffled, completely baffled. And then, as you find a bit out about it, you become sceptical. You think, nah, it can't possibly work. It's, you know, what's the point? And then you gradually you sort of start getting curious about it. And then you end up, you know, people often end up being interested and excited by it. And I should add that those things actually don't necessarily happen consecutively. They can all happen at the same time. I mean, I quite often find myself studying this stuff, feeling baffled, sceptical, curious and excited all at the same time. Um, so if you do feel that, don't worry. It's perfectly normal. It doesn't mean you've forgotten to take your medication. <laughs> so um, Bitcoin uh, was launched on the world on 31st October 2008. Um, it's possibly a significant date because that was a few weeks after Lehman Brothers collapsed and the whole global financial system had its near-death experience and we were within hours of cash points all around the developed world just sort of running out of money and not working. Um, and it was started, it first appearance was in a, a paper published in an online discussion forum by Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, and the crucial thing about Satoshi Nakamoto is no one knows who that is. No one knows if it's a he, a she, an it, or a they, or a collective entity. And not the least astonishing thing about Bitcoin is that seven years later, after lots and lots of people who have devoted lots and lots of energy and resources to finding out Satoshi's identity, nobody actually has a clue who it is. Um, and to understand the central idea of Bitcoin, you have to think a bit first about what, what money is in its modern form. And the best place to start for that is it's a group of islands in the Pacific Ocean called Yap. They're part of Micronesia. If you go to the northeast corner of Australia, where the Barrier Reef is, and go up about 1,800 miles, you come to, you come to Yap. Um, and the thing about Yap is they have no metal. So to make coins, to make currency, what they do is they sail uh, overseas in open boats across the Pacific to a neighboring group of islands called Pulau, which has limestone. And they quarry the limestone and they make it into these very distinctive circular, in quotes, coins that are made of stone. Um, a hole in the middle and they're round and some of them are quite wieldy, small coins, but some of them are absolutely gigantic. They go up to 12 feet across, which is, you can imagine is twice, that's from there to... That is one seriously freaking big stone coin. <laughs> and then they sail them back to Yap, and where they use as currency, and they work well as currency for a number of reasons, because they hold their value quite well. That's one of the main things money is. It's a store of value. But obviously, there's, there's no limestone on Yap, so it keeps its value quite well. Similarly, you can't counterfeit it, because you've got nothing to counterfeit it with. Again, there's no limestone. And uh, also, you can't steal it. You can't nick a 12-foot stone <laughs> coin. It's, it's impossible. But by the same token, a 12-foot stone coin, you can't nick it, which is good. On the other hand, you can't move it, which you might, you'd have thought might be a problem. But instead, the way that the yappies have solved this, you say, um, I've got a 12-foot stone coin and I want to buy Marion's house. Uh, I just say to Marion, OK, I'm giving you this coin. You own it now. And she says, yeah, OK, fine, that's a fair deal. You own the, you own the house, I own the coin. And we tell the chief that the coin now belongs to Marion, that the coin doesn't move, but the ownership changes. And then she might want to use it to buy, buy a boat of, of Tim, say. So again, she, they agree the deal. They tell the chief. The chief remembers, OK, that whacking great stone coin outside John's house actually now used to belong to Marion, now belongs to Tim. And the ownership transfers. 
And the thing about that is that is what money is. It's the record of ownership. It's the register of ownership. That's what modern money is. It's like a, it's a ledger. And, and yeah, they take it so far that um, sometimes when they're sailing back from Pulau with the massive stone coins, they get caught by storms. If you're in an open boat crossing the Pacific with a 12-foot stone coin, and it's either you know, your life or the coin, sometimes you go, oh, sorry, sorry, coin mate, and they lob it over, sea, over, over the side. And then they get back to Yap, they say what's happened, and the Yapis say, okay, well, who owned the coin at that point when it was lobbed over the side of the boat? The owner is named. They say, okay, fine, it's still yours. And you can still buy things with a coin and still transact its ownership, and the ownership can pass backwards and forwards. You can buy things with it, sell things with it. The coin is still valid currency, even though it's lying five miles down at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> now, that might seem bizarre and odd and exotic, but actually that is what modern money is. It's the register of ownership. We think of coins as being things to do with notes and banknotes and coins and all that. And money is not that anymore. Uh, there's $473 trillion of money in the world at the moment. 46 trillion of that, so less than a tenth, is actually coins and notes. The rest is entries on bank balances. It's numbers on balance sheets. In the UK, it's even more so. Um, only 4% of the money in the UK is in physical form. The rest is entries on ledgers. And when, you, when you're paid for your work at the end of the week or month or whatever, all that happens is a, a number changes on your employer's bank balance and a number changes on your bank balance. And if you're up for PAYE tax, a number changes on the, on the government's bank balance. And then the, the numbers change again as you pay for insurance, you pay your rent or your mortgage, you pay your credit card bills, you pay your utility bills, you pay your phone bills, whatever. All those are just numbers moving on, on registers and ledgers. Now, the crucial thing about Bitcoin is that that's what it is. It's a register and a ledger. The existing ones we use are underpinned by the authority of the state. You have the sovereign's head on the current currency, and um, you have a central bank which underpins the banking system, and the banking system creates money, and the whole thing is kind of entity or arm or underwritten by the state. Bitcoin takes the register and just removes everything else. It just is that central thing and nothing else. And the um, central piece of technology involved in how it works is called the blockchain. Um, and, uh, I mean, I could do a whole 15 minutes uh, um, just on, on the technology of Bitcoin, so I'm only going to focus on one bit. And the blockchain is a publicly uh, visible register of every transaction that has ever happened with Bitcoin. Every time a Bitcoin has been used, the transaction is encrypted, added to the blockchain, and then verified by this network of computers. There's a massive network of computers checking transactions as they go along. And um, it's important to also note that the, the transactions, you don't know who they are between, because they're between Bitcoin wallets, which are just strings of numbers on the network. Um, and if you lose the password to your Bitcoin wallet, that's it, you've lost all the Bitcoin, it's irretrievable, it can't be recovered, it's gone forever. But at the same time, so you can see which addresses have exchanged the coins, but you don't know anything more about them, and yet the, trans the, the transaction is completely in the open. And that's a very unusual combination of features, total and anonymity combined with total transparency. And um, because it's this whole network of computers using cryptographic techniques to check that the transactions are valid, it's um, impossible to fail. It's, it's quite easy to verify a real transaction, easy if you have masses of powerful computers, but it's impossible to fake, and it's also impossible to counterfeit a Bitcoin or to spend a Bitcoin twice. So it's a really very robust set of cryptographical techniques that create this decentralized, anonymous, verifiable register. And as I said, that register is money. So the question now, I suppose, is, so what? You know, so what will the consequences and upshot of Bitcoin be? Because it's already um, a multi-billion dollar business. David Badil actually asked me just before I came on how many Bitcoins, what's the value of the total Bitcoins in circulation, which was a good question. I never looked it up before. And it's about um, three and a half billion dollars at current valuation. It's down from about 20 billion dollars because Bitcoin's had a, a crash in value over the last year or so. So it's already a big economy. 75,000 odd businesses take Bitcoin. Um, Expedia, the travel site, takes Bitcoin. Dell, the computer manufacturer, takes Bitcoin. You can buy food with it. You can buy plane tickets with it. You can book hotels with it. You can do all sorts of things with it. Um, and it's only going to grow. And I think the first place it's going to have a big impact is on the, the unbanked. 
Um, most adults in the globally don't have bank accounts um, because they have problems. They can't prove they are who they say they are, and they can't prove that they own the things they do own. Um, the Brazilian economist Herman Soto pointed out that the poor often have quite a lot of assets. He studied shanties in favelas in Brazil. And noticed that the poor often had, had houses and huts and property in them. It's just that they couldn't prove they own them. They had no legal title to them. They couldn't get access to banking facilities to open up credit. With Bitcoin, that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter who you are. You only need a Bitcoin wallet. And the thing is that anyone with a phone can have a Bitcoin wallet. And there are 2.5 million people in the, billion people in the world with with bank accounts, but there are six billion with mobile phones, which is more than there are with flush toilets. So um, if Bitcoin becomes more uh, widely available, it will open up all sorts of opportunities for the poor to have access to credit transactions and money transactions in the way that they don't currently have. And you're already seeing things like there's a network of Afghani women filmmakers um, who are um, paid by a non-profit based in America to make films about just the daily texture of their lives. And they're paid in Bitcoin because they don't have access to any kind of banking facilities. They live in Taliban-controlled areas of Afghanistan. They can barely go out of the house. But they can be paid in Bitcoin, and they can buy equipment with Bitcoin. And I think we'll see more and more things like that as the unbanked have access to these technologies. Um, and the other area where I think Bitcoin as a technology, not necessarily as a currency, that there's a Bitcoin with a capital B is the money and Bitcoin with a lowercase b is the, is the technology. And I think it's the technology that has the uh, most potential. Um, and I think there's all sorts of potential for things like, because um, you can attach anything to the blockchain. There are people who've attached their own DNA sequences to the blockchain and, and uploaded it to the network so anyone could see it. Um, and as that becomes um, more widely adopted, you'll be able to do things like attach other forms of credit and turn them into money, things like energy credits, things like mobile phone credits, things like nectar car points, things like air miles, you'll be able to attach them to the blockchain and give them away. They will effectively monetize and turn into money all these things that actually at the moment aren't money. And that has the potential to be a transformatory thing and that for the first time in human history we'll have forms of money that don't have the imprimatur of the state, of some form of state control or state backing. Um, it goes back to the Bible, really, to that point where, in the Gospel of Matthew, where it's the famous point where they try and trap Jesus into saying, you know, should you pay, the t should you pay taxes or not? And he, everyone remembers his answer, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. But the really interesting thing is the question he asked just before that. They say, should you pay your taxes? And, and Jesus says to the Pharisees, whose image is on the coin? And the answer comes back, Caesar's. He says, okay, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. But the interesting question, whose answer is on the coin? The answer through, throughout human history has been Caesar. It's always the emperor. It's always the state. It's always the state authority which gives the currency its imprimatur. And now for the first time in human history, it might be possible that that's not true, that you'll have another answer in that you know, there's effectively no one's image on the coin or everyone's image. And one of the interesting possibilities that opens up is that of um, not just, we've, we've heard a bit about things like self-driving cars, uh, which are coming in 20, 2020 or 2030, depending on who you believe. But I think a really interesting possibility is that of self-owning cars. Uh, because a car, can't, can't, a car can't have a bank account, but it can have a Bitcoin wallet. And so you can imagine a community, maybe a rural community, 100 people get together, chuck in 200 quid each, buy a car, which then effectively owns itself. And rides are paid for in bit, rides are paid for in Bitcoin. The um, money goes back. The people who've bought the car are gradually paid back over time, and then the car uses the excess cash to pay for its own insurance, pay for its own servicing, build up a bit of a fund of cash, and then after five years, it effectively replaces itself. Now that's just one example, but the idea of self-owning entities, self-owning entities and institutions, I think is a really potentially very interesting one because we have problems at the moment both with models that are fully of ownership that are fully controlled by the state or models that are fully capitalist and privatized and I think the possibility of some kind of hybrid form of things and in, in institutions and entities effectively owning themselves is, is really um, apart from being really strange it's also really interesting and really feels like something new in the world I think that you know the last really huge change in the way the register worked came in um, Renaissance Italy 
and it was to do with, before that, credits and debits were between individuals. You had a society where all sorts of people owed things backwards and forth, and you know, I had a debt to you, you had a debt to someone else, we had credits to a third party, that was all diverse. And what happened in Renaissance Italy, where you had a new set of record-keeping techniques, which brought all of these onto the ledger, ledger of one institution, which was a bank. So instead of owing money sort of at random to each other, the bank took money when we had excess money and then lent it out when people had a need for credit. And the bank became the thing that gathered together all of these diverse credits and debits onto one central ledger. And that was the last big change in the way the register worked. And the place where it happened was Renaissance, Renaissance Florence, and the bank that did it was the Medici. And if you think of the potential for cultural and economic transformation that unlocked the last time we had something big happen to the register, I think it, you know, it suggests that something really exciting could happen with this new next big thing to happen in the way that the register of money works. Thank you very much.